Okay, thank you, Marina, and thank you very much for introducing where I'm headed. Um, I'm a physiatrist, physical medicine and rehab, and I should have put this on a slide, but the uh, word I'd like to introduce to you, the phrase, is physiatric intensivist. There are only a few of us, actually, in the country. I'm hoping to train more over time, but I spent my entire career in the hospital setting. I actually don't like acute rehab. To me, it's a little slow. I'd rather hang out with you guys in the ICU, which is what I've been doing, and bringing those rehab interventions into the ICU. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't give you a little bit of history. Um, oh, the, the Hippocrates was actually the very first. He mentions even in his original work that bed rest is a bad thing, and certainly people were encouraged not to stay still. And so, in fact, prior to the 19th century, bed rest was not part of medical care. As soon as somebody could move, they moved. And when you think about how medical care was delivered, that makes a lot of sense. Much more in the home, less in hospitals. Um, you didn't really have intensive care units and those sorts of things. But the rest cure became really popular in the 1800s. Now, to be fair, a lot of it was done for what was deemed hysterical women, and they would be put on complete bed rest for six weeks. And when I mean complete bed rest, I mean someone feeds them. It's, of course, entirely um, bedpan use. They were not allowed to do anything. But that um, infiltrated then into the, all the rest of medicine. And this notion that bed rest was somehow a good thing took over medical care. As intensive care units started to be spawned, it became even more of a goal to be on bed rest. And so bed rest actually, from that point until about the mid-20th century, was very much the standard in a lot of medicine. And then, so Howard Rusk, um, he is an internist, by the way. Um, this is uh, Dr. Rusk practiced general internal medicine, hospital-based internal medicine, for most of his career. A and then a war broke out, and he was a military medical officer. Um, and when you think about World War II, there were a lot of casualties, a lot of people involved, and not enough beds to hold them all. Not enough beds. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Because we certainly struggle with that all the time. So he implemented a plan of lots of activity. Now, early mobility, in, in, it was early for them. It wouldn't be early to us. But he moved people much earlier, and he had a reputation for being able to return soldiers to the battlefield or to home if they were not able to return to duty much faster than anyone ever had historically and get those beds emptied so they could take on the next soldiers who needed them. Um, he came on, went on to be essentially one of the two founding fathers of my specialty. Um, and so he now, the Rusk Institute in New York has been named for him, um, but he is now one of those people that we look toward as one of our fathers. The other thing that happened is Eisenhower had an MI. And this was a very big deal in the news back then. Um, he was in Denver at the time, as was the custom, bed rest was prescribed. At that time, an, M an MI stayed in bed for six weeks. Yeah. Um, he wasn't allowed to see people other than family. He wasn't allowed to work. He wasn't allowed to do anything. And then they asked a civilian doctor to come in and consult. And that doctor promptly got him moving. So instead of a full six weeks, he got up uh, maybe a little over a month, maybe four, which still sounds like a long time, of course, to us, but up and moving and then up and walking. What was originally thought to be a career-ending MI turned out to not be at all, and he went on to run the next, for the next election and win and serve as president for another term. And this changed across the board the way medical care was practiced. Because if it was the best thing for the president, then it probably is the best thing for everyone. Four weeks is still a long time. But that trend continued. So why are we still putting people on bed rest? Well, there's culture. We all have a tendency to practice the way we were trained. And there are cultures 
for most of us in the ICU to keep them on bed rest. There's tradition. It's sort of what we've always done. And don't we sort of do what we've always done? And then the big one is fear. What I hear all the time is fear. I'm going to lose a line. I'm going to lose the ET tube. Maybe it's bad for them. Will they have an MI when they're active? Will they, we, they deset? All of those fears. The problem is, is that we know very well that the complications related, the outcome of prolonged bed rest is high. And the risk of actually mobilizing them is nowhere near what we tend to think it is. So let's move on to the rehab team. The rehab team in acute care is made up of these four groups, the physiatrist, the speech therapist, the OT, and the physical therapist. Um, I, I didn't put a Venn diagram up here because I thought it was cute. I put a Venn diagram because, in fact, there's a lot of overlap between each specialist. And it's something that you will have to do a little bit of investigation in, in your specific um, hospital. Because sometimes what I'm used to, the OT does, the speech therapist may do, or the PT may do instead of the OT, etc. So there will be a little bit of investigation. But I'm going to go through the principles excuse me, of what each therapist generally provides. So currently, PTs are doctorally prepared. You will have master's prepared PTs who are grandfathered in and allowed to maintain their license, but all new PTs are doctorally prepared. Um, they are trained in these things, the principles of exercise. They learn a lot about cardiopulmonary needs. Um, cardiac rehab is generally run by an extra exercise physiologist, but some, if somebody has a neurologic deficit or a reason why they can't participate in something traditional, it is the physical therapist who will come in and do that. Um, as everybody knows, ambulation, mobility aids, that's kind of bread and butter for them. They also know a lot about balance and vestibular disease. In fact, vestibular therapy is pretty much exclusively the realm of the PT. This, of course, is the therapist that everybody involves. Marina certainly, certainly mentioned the, the PT specifically. The one that everybody tends to forget is the occupational therapist. And I can't say enough about the importance of involving OT in your setting. So OTs are masters prepared. Um, they aren't, you know, occupational medicine is about uh, people returning to work. Occupational therapy is not. Occupational therapy is about your daily occupation, whether you're working or not. So that is all of your ADLs, self-care. Um, occupational therapists are particularly trained in cognitive therapy, coping therapy. There are OTs in psychiatric units. In fact, most psychiatric units have an OT involved who trains psych patients how to return to a community and cope with an environment of people around them in community. Um, they also happen to be the people who do most of the splinting. They'll make assessments for a proper positioning splint. They'll make custom splints. Um, and they are the owner of all assistive devices other than the gate aids. So reachers, um, built-up utensils for people with arthritis or hand weakness, um, any number of those. Um, OTs generally also have this additional training in visual spatial. And so, particularly in stroke patients, traumatic brain injury, um, visual spatial disturbances can be a huge problem with why people are responding to you strangely. Um, if they're diplopic, if their vision is blurred, if they have neglect and they can't see you, or a field cut that changes how they interact with everyone, and it is the OT often who picks it up and can start to address it. Uh, then there's the speech therapist, master's degree. You tend to know them for language, both spoken and written, and voice therapy. They also work with oral strength and coordination. People have weakness in the region. Um, swallow is a part of it, cognitive assessment. Um, but the thing not to forget is augmented communication. Your patients, if they can't communicate, is a significant problem. If you're using alphabet boards, picture boards, and they don't seem to be working well, it's your speech therapist who can come in and therefore assist and train your patients so that they have a means of communication. I think we all know that when patients can communicate their needs, then their agitation and some of their difficulty starts to diminish. 
And then there's me, the physiatrist. So we are an internship plus three years of residency. Um, and if you think about what we do in acute rehab, which I think most people don't know, have any idea, frankly, what we do, um, our job in that setting is to identify and treat all the barriers to people actually getting their therapies. And in some ways, that's exactly what I do in the ICU. My job is to identify and even anticipate what is going to keep people from moving through the system, from getting up, from being active, to getting off that vent. And those are any number of things. Um, sleep, pain, early um, identification of depression, um, where the fatigue is, their anxiety disorders, um, but also some very medical things. Um, I uh, am, am pretty well versed in the entire spectrum of ICU acquired weakness. I know we think about myopathy and peripheral neuropathy, but there are other options. There's prolonged neuromuscular blockade. You can pith somebody's cord in a difficult intubation. There are a number of things that can play into this. People have perioperative strokes. People have watershed strokes, which look um, like a myopathy, but are really severe and associated with cognitive deficits. So there are a number of things that I will go looking for to be able to, be able to better define. Some of that is my overlap with neurology. I think one of the differences is my reason for getting a diagnosis is so that I know how to treat people from a rehabilitation perspective. Um, I tend to order fewer tests. I tend to say, oh, it's most likely these sorts of things, so we're going to move that way. When you are um, uncomfortable with traveling people or doing a lot of tests in the ICU, your physiatrist is probably the one who's going to get you to the place they need to be as opposed to the neurologist who will work them up. But I work with my neurologist all the time. So let's talk about early mobility. Now, I, I have to imagine every one of you have seen the famous picture, the Needham picture, the person gowned on a vent, walking with like four people gathered around them. Yes? You've all seen it. And early mobility is all interesting and sexy, and everybody is excited about the walking down the hall on the vent. So let's talk about what the actual outcomes are. Now, I'll tell you, there are plenty of studies and reviews out there. Again, it's very sexy and interesting. But the truth is, there are two studies that I actually think give you real value. And those are these, the Morris and the Schweikert. And that's because a whole host of studies that preceded this called early mobility starting somewhere between two and four weeks, which doesn't sound early to me at all. Early mobility to me is actually starting where these were, which is within a few days of their onset of mechanical ventilation. And so they started with the progression, sitting up, sitting edge of bed, coming to stand, and walking. Um, and as you can see, the Morris study found no difference in the number of ventilator days. The Schweikert study found 2.3 fewer ventilator days. Their averages were in the, the, the six to eight range to give you some idea of where that was. Length of stay, um, Morris a few fewer days in the ICU and a pretty significant shorter overall hospital length of stay. I would say that's actually one of the things that we've seen um, as much as from Marina's data, we didn't necessarily see a lot shorter in the ICU, what happened is when they transitioned to the floor, people were already mobile and active. And therefore, their time in a regular unit was dramatically shortened. So they got out of the ICU, they got to the floor, and in a day or two were ready to go, as opposed to now trying to get them up, and they're very deconditioned, and it's very hard to move them along. Um, Schweikert also saw the shorter ICU stay and a little bit shorter, oh, I'm sorry, and a longer hospital length of stay. And frankly, looking at the study, I'm not entirely sure why, but so it is. So let's go back to the complications. Oh, actually, one thing. This is probably the most important. There are about 20 published studies. Late, as in they call it early, but two to four weeks, very early people with ET tubes, people with trachs, only one unplanned extubation associated with mobility. One. Hundreds of patients 
This is not the time that we have unplanned extubations. ET tubes in a properly organized group do not come out. Safety is the thing I, I want to stress to you. You don't need to be afraid. A well-organized mobility team knows exactly how to do this. And physical therapists can certainly come to any number of the hospitals that are doing them already and be able to make sure that they understand what to do in an ICU. Because if you have a team who's never gotten to come into your ICU, there's a bit of a learning curve. But afterward, no problem. Let me remind you why we do this. So we know from lots of data, long-standing data, 10 to 12% loss of muscle mass per week. Five dietitians in the group realize that people are in negative nitrogen balance by necessity. It is obligatory with bed rest. And so if you're doing a UUN, you have to calculate a bit of that. Um, there is bone loss. Think about your elders. There's a significant amount of bone loss. People can move to a half percent to one percent of bone loss per week. So know that that's important. What you see medically is hypercalcuria, and even if you have a renal patient, hypercalcemia as a result of that bone loss. From a pulmonary standpoint, this lack of diaphragmatic excursion and poor expansion. Now, I'm a physiatrist, which means I am really kinesthetic in the way I learn and think. So I want you all to have, to have a little exercise right here. So those chairs are lovely. I want everybody to lean back in them as far as you can go. Take your elbows, put them inside the rest, down against your side, and put your hands on your thighs. And really, yeah. This, for the most part, is the semi-fowler position. This is what all your patients are laying in. It's actually not quite as far back, but it's close. Now laying there, keep yourself down in there, take the deepest breath you can. And notice how far your chest moves. Now try to cough. <laughs> all right, now everybody sit up and lean slightly forward. Take the deepest breath you can. How much bigger was that? Now cough. <laughs> you hear the difference in the noise? We lay people in bed, and we expect them to breathe and cough, and you can't. The next time you have the flu or any other respiratory illness, you will realize that when you really need to cough something up, if you're in bed, you roll over or you sit up because we just can't cough <coughs> like that. And if you really need to take a deep breath, you have to free up your back. We're laying people on their lungs. Largest lungs are lowers. They're, they're in back. Laying somebody on their lungs, they have to lift their entire body weight. And the heavier your patient, the greater the problem. So any amount of moving them up off of their backs. So MediChair doesn't quite do it. They have to get them all the way up. Causes better diaphragmatic excursion and expansion. Um, I can't say enough about constipation or distended bowel. Have a big belly, distend it out. You can't open your lungs. You can't move your diaphragm. Um, loss of appetite, depression is a significant problem. Um, and then blood volume loss, 10% over the first few days of lying in complete bed rest. Um, bellows mechanics, it's really what I, do, for the most part, just ask you to do. I'll also remind you, if you're dealing with bowel issues, it is very hard to pass flatus when you are lying completely down. And if you have them in the VAT bundle and you've got the head of bed up, that makes it even harder. They will become increasingly distended if you don't get them not just rolled over 10 or 15 degrees or even 20, but a little bit more to actually get flatus to move. So just be aware of that. Okay, mobility teams. These are the components of the people who need to be present when you are going to mobilize somebody. The nurse is usually responsible for all the lines, chest tubes if they're there, all of that. The physical therapist is responsible for the gait. They will actually be hands-on in getting people to, to move and have a decent gait quality for balance. The respiratory therapist, as always, owns the airway and the vent. You want, if you've got an ET tube, not so much a tray, if you've got an ET tube, you want the RT to do nothing 
but pay attention to the airway. It's one of the reasons you make sure you don't have an unplanned extubation. Um, a tech, this can be a nursing tech or a rehab tech, has the backup wheelchair, if somebody gets too fatigued, is the person making sure that we don't um, drop the patient. And then often co-treating with an occupational therapist who is engaging the patient, um, asking them to look around the room, having them sort of talk through what's going on. Now that said, it is not all about walking. You cannot walk if you're covered with terrible peripheral edema, especially in the uppers. Um, if you start to lose range, if you think about it, if you've ever skied and you've, um, you've put on uh, ski boots, you can't move your foot. You don't have mo movement around your ankle. Walking is really hard. If you're tight across the pectorals, that semi fowler position I just put you in, tightness across the chest, you go to stand up and you're stuck here. It's a very hard position in which to walk. So we need to do that. Participation in self-care. I can't tell you the value of teaching somebody to be able to suction their own mouths. Whatever you have to do to help them do that, it gives them something they can do. It gives them some control. And in an ICU, what patients most want is a little bit of control because they actually have none. The truth is, as I said, sitting edge of bed is incredibly valuable. Coming to a stand at the bedside, you don't have to go down the hallway. Coming to a bed to stand, marching in place, those matter enormously and in fact can give you, just marching in place, some of the same benefits that you get walking down the hallway. Um, transferring to a chair, if you're coming to a stand to transfer, is really valuable. Now, I like getting people up and sitting. Medi chair, bed chair position, all good. But not as good as sitting edge of bed or standing to transfer. There are some contraindications. They're fairly obvious. If you have a, a, a tentative, um, a tenuous airway, yeah, you want to be really careful. Um, if you're having difficulty oxygenating, we don't need to, improve, to increase oxygen demand. Um, obviously, the unstable spine and pelvis. Um, the last one's important. If there is a reason why you can't improve sedation, then decrease sedation, then you need to, to not get them up. I'll tell you, as much as um, Marina tells you our goal is sort of zero to minus two for RAS, zero to minus two is not where we want to be if we're going to mobilize. Zero to plus two is actually where we want to be. A little bit of agitation is not a terrible thing when you're going to mobilize. You want them a little more active. If they're kind of moving around, that's because they want to get up. They can't be combative. They need to be redirectable. But most people are moving around because they either want to roll over on their side because it's more comfortable or they want to stand up. So let's mobilize them. That means you're going to have to lift sedation for these to get them up to there. So let's talk about our goals. Oh, somehow this didn't happen. So the first goal is to preserve range. There are, everyone is involved. Nurses should be working on positioning. Frankly, in good nursing daily care, you can achieve full range of every joint every day. You've got to get to the perineum so you can fully range the legs up. You should be checking getting to the axilla so you can fully range the arms up. You should be able to do that. PTs can help with stretching. If people have increased tone after a stroke, they can stretch that. Do compression therapy to reduce edema and teach families how to do this. The more we let families, giving them something to do in the ICU, takes the load off of us and they have some control. My goal is to look at the pre-existing deficits, contracture, people who are losing range and start to address that as well as limitations related to pain. The next goal. Gosh, diminished delirium, isn't that what we spent the last 45 minutes talking about? So again, frequent orientation, maintaining day-night differences, there are a lot of environmental controls, engaging your patient. Orientation and engagement. We do have a tendency to talk at patients instead of talking to patients. We also have a huge tendency to talk with other people in the room and ignore that there is a human being sitting there. You would never do that in front of us and just ignore them. So it is important that you maintain engagement with the patient. Um, OTs do the cognitive assessment, um, that, that idea of self-suction and more upright activity during the day. 
The more people are awake and active during the day, the more likely they'll sleep for you at night. You start to wear people out. And being upright is natural for us. It, in fact, is very disorienting to always be laying down. It makes no sense. The truth is, is that most of us are like the old-fashioned dolls. You lay down, and you sort of close your eyes, but then you get restless. You sit up, you become more alert. My job is to look for the underlying causes of delirium, everything else that could be going in and to treat them, to treat sleep, to treat pain. Now, I'll tell you something. I know Marina said Haldol. I actually hate Haldol. Um, I've seen way too many cases, cases of tardive dyskinesia, even with not high doses. Um, I've seen a few neuroleptic malignant syndromes, so you have to be really careful. Seroquel is a popular choice. Please be aware that up to 50 milligrams, Seroquel is almost exclusively antihistaminic. It's kind of an expensive Benadryl. At 75 milligrams, it adds an anticholinergic component, so it becomes an expensive Elevil. And at 100 milligrams, it starts to get anti-dopa, so similar into the Haldol range. But anti-dopa areas are the places of concern. So if I'm going to use it, I only go up to 50 or 75 unless I actually have a psychiatric patient. Um, but just be aware of what the actual activity is. My personal favorites, Ambien is fine. Um, I use Trazodone, 50, and you can push that up to about 100. I use Amitriptyline, 25 to 50, maybe 75. Doxepin is a particularly powerful antihistaminic and can be ideal. Um, Remeron, especially in the elderly, uh, you have a lot of issues about appetite to compete with, so Remeron can be a nice choice as well. And then there's improving the ventilatory capacity. I've really talked through this. Um, I wanted to put in my area there. Um, one of the things I'm always looking for is ICU weakness. ICU weakness is almost exclusively a proximal weakness. If you have proximal weakness, that proximal weakness includes your bellows. So while I know as intensivist, you spend a lot of time thinking about oxygenation, perhaps a little bit lesser degree to ventilation, my job is to look at the neuromusculoskeletal aspect, the actual movement of the bellows. If you have somebody on very low volume ventilation for a long period of time, you get contracture of the intercostal muscles no differently than getting contracture every place else. Um, I've actually had to do manual therapy to open up people's chests. So maintaining notions of opening the chest, it is not a bad thing unless there are a lot of problems to do intermittent high volume ventilation. That means a few minutes at a very high volume, 15 to 20 cc's per kilo of high volume ventilation, a couple of minutes. It's going to open the chest, decrease atelectasis, and maintain chest wall range of motion. And frankly, if you're doing it when they're sitting up, that's ideal. That's the most important thing that you want. It will change your ultimate outcome in, in liberation from the ventilator. So thank you, and maybe not a lot of time for questions.